So we're sitting in the Simpson Desert at the moment. We're sitting in between two large red parallel dunes that run for many kilometres north-south. Sitting in the harder soil area where you get trees like this Gigi coming through. And I guess we're, we're at the end of a, end of a three-week trip where we've been catching a wide variety of the animals that occur here. Small, uh, small mammals like the native rodents, hopping mice, desert mice, vandula mice, as well as a range of small marsupials, the dunarts, the uh, ningawis. We've also been catching a um, wide range of reptiles catch and one of the reasons for coming to the Simpson Desert is that it's got one of the CEO highest diversities of them. reptiles of any arid zone that we know about. In a square kilometre of desert here you're likely to find 50, 55, if you're lucky, 60 species of reptiles. So it's an incredibly rich area. There are large numbers of birds that characterise the desert. Over 130 species use the desert to a greater or lesser extent. And from the point of view of biodiversity and biodiversity management, conservation issues, the Simpson really is a, a very exciting place to come. Uh, we've been coming back now for 20 years to study this environment and to try to figure out what factors influence the diversity that does occur here. If you look at the plants, we've also got around 100 and, uh, 140, 150 species of plants in the sand dunes alone. One of the important plants is this Gigi that, uh, that is around us at the moment. Gigi's act as important refuge areas for a range of animals. They also act as refugia for the plants. So plants like the ruby salt bush here or the other salt bushes you'll often find under the shade of Gigi. They come up because they've been sheltered from the, the extremes of the, the environment. The seeds also collect at the base of the trees and they're protected to some degree from grazing animals. Although there are no cattle here on this property anymore, Ethabooka Reserve, there are cattle that are grown throughout, raised throughout much of the Simpson Desert environment. One of the first things that we noticed when the cattle were removed from Ethabooka was that the red kangaroos started to move right back into the Gigi. So we saw around four times as many red kangaroos after the cattle had been removed as compared to before. But then after a, a year or a couple of years of monitoring the responses of the small mammals and the lizards, the small mammals increased in numbers. This was a, a PhD project that was carried out by Anka Frank at the University of Sydney. And Anka found that there was an increase in mammal abundance after cattle had been removed, probably because the hard hooves of the cattle destroy the burrows where many of the species make their burrows and their nests, and probably also because they're taking off some of the, the productivity, some of the salt bush and its seeds. Many of the other desert plants that would be eaten by cattle now become available to the native animals. So an increase in the, in the native mammals was, was one very obvious uh, effect of taking cattle out. But this is early, early days. The, the desert is a, a long-term and, as we're discovering, very complex environment. And what we suspect is that with long-term removal of big grazing animals, the Gigi will itself recover. And the Gigi appears to be an important refuge habitat for the mammals during drought. So if the Gigi is intact, if the Gigi is able to regenerate and act as a, a nurse plant for the many other species that co-occur with it, there'll be more shelter resources, more shade, more food, more seeds, more invertebrates being produced. And probably over the longer term, and this might be 25 years, it might be 50 years or more, we should expect to see the Gigi in the cattle-free areas being increasingly important as conservation loci within the desert. So that during dry times, although it's tough to make a living out on the sand dunes, species will come back to the Gigi. And this will be where we'll find probably the majority of the species, the highest population abundances during the dry times in future. And we're just beginning to see those trends right now, five years after cattle have been removed. One of the, one of the major effects of having cattle in this part of the, of the desert is that there were a series of natural waterholes, beautiful waterholes. Some of them are still intact, but for the most part they've been degraded very badly by the, by the cattle industry. As cattle come in to get the, the free-flowing waters, they degrade the edges of the, of the artesian, of uh, the springs, the mound springs. They trample them down to the point where the water turns to mud. The native fish that might have been present, the native snails, the other invertebrates, the plants that might have been endemic to those waterholes, all are lost. And 
it's once once they've been degraded to that point, it's very difficult to get them back. When some of the endemic species that occurred there and nowhere else have gone, what do you do to return them, to recover them? They've gone for good. And the other very sad thing about the waterholes, I think, is that many of these waterholes, before they were found and used by the pastoral industry, would have been used to a large extent by the local people, by the traditional people. They would have been used as ports of call on trading routes, the pitchery trading routes and other trading routes, the song lines. And they would have been used as refugia by the medium-sized native mammals that no longer occur. One of the reasons why the medium-sized mammals, the, the bandicoots, the, the pig-footed bandicoots, the desert bandicoots, the rat kangaroos, the stick nest rats, one of the reasons why these species no longer occur in arid environments is almost certainly because as stock moved in and corrupted the, the waterholes, there was then no longer any place for the medium-sized mammals to contract back to during dry times. In some areas of the Artesian Basin, water is still being pumped out at, uh, at quite a high rate and there's evidence that the, the pressure at which it's coming out is diminishing and almost certainly, this isn't, isn't true perhaps for all of the Artesian Basin, but for some areas that have had a long history of use, perhaps overuse, the rate of flow is declining and we do know that the, the rate of recovery of the Artesian system isn't keeping up with the, the rate of extraction. So if we keep this up, we're mining a very precious resource without the prospect of, uh, of recovery, at least in the short term.